I think we can all agree that this has been a different kind of Christmas, just like these last few months. It was hard, you know, Christmas. It took Santa Claus a lot longer to get around to every house because he kept forgetting his mask and he had to go back to the sleigh and get it. Um, we, we'll close our emphasis on Christmas and head into a new year. I think a lot of us are glad that 2020 will soon be in our rearview mirror. But what's ahead of us? Uh, beginning next Sunday, we're going to, to start uh, a series uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. And if you uh, want to get ahead a little bit, you might want to read Matthew 5 through 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's a collection of the teachings of Christ. Um, and we're going to begin this series that is entitled A Journey That Lasts a Lifetime. When we come to Christ, it's just the part, the beginning of a journey. Some, uh, some of us think we just get our foot in the door, we get fire insurance, and we're safe. But the truth of the matter is, there's so much more. And for the follower of Jesus, there are other steps that we take that draw us closer and closer to becoming the person that Christ wants us to be. I think it's a journey worth examining. And uh, I hope you'll, you'll be a part of those services. Today, away from a manger. We've journeyed toward Bethlehem. We have thought about all the significance of the birth of Christ. Now what? We know the story. We've, we've heard it so many times. As we said before, many people can quote most of them from the King James Version, but quoting the Christmas story out of Luke. But there's more, right? There's, there are things that happened after the birth that impact all of us. So today I want to talk about a mission, a call to spread the good news. In Luke chapter 2, we have the, the visit of the shepherds, and they come and they see the child, and they've witnessed this magnificent uh, chorus of angels, the concert for the good news of the birth of Christ. But what happened to the shepherds after they found Mary and Joseph and the babe. Well, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. So the shepherds took their experience and they did something with it, and I guess the question I'd like for us to wrestle with a bit today is, what are we doing with the news we've received? Has it made a difference? Has it made a difference in our perspective, in our worldview? Has it made a difference in our relationships? Has it made a difference in the choices that we make with the time that God allows? Now what do we do? Did you get what you wanted for Christmas? I guess you didn't. You're just standing, sitting there staring at me. Uh, you might know the name Charles Swindoll. Is that a familiar name to you? He was, um, um, is known for being a longtime pastor, an author, president of the seminary. He's done a lot of things. When Charles Swindoll was just a boy, he had begun to hint early on that what he really wanted for Christmas was a basketball. And every opportunity he got, he would just, you know, make another suggestion about what he wanted for Christmas. And a few days before Christmas, he looked under the tree, and there were all the packages there. And there was this one package, and it, you couldn't hide the shape. It was round. He was so excited. He thought, I'm going to get what I want. Christmas morning came. They went in to open all the presents, and he couldn't wait until he got his hands on that round package. And with great excitement, he unwrapped the package, and it was a globe. It's really hard to dribble a globe. 
we may not always get what we want. But God has a way of giving us what we need. I'm kind of glad that God hasn't answered all my want prayers. But I'm also very humble that he has answered all my need prayers. There's a difference. Well, let's ask the shepherds. What did you get for Christmas? Well, the astounding news of prophecy fulfilled. Now, I don't know that any of those shepherds were theologians. Because of their own background, because of their heritage, because of the simple fact they were Jews, they knew that there was a promise yet to be fulfilled. It is said that um, every Jewish mother would pray that her son would grow up to be the Messiah. We used to do that here in America, you know, every now and then mothers would want their, their child, mostly their, their male children, to grow up to be president of the United States. I don't know any mother that would want that now. But for the Jews, there was a sense that something great was going to happen. And those shepherds on that occasion when the angels came to announce the birth of the, of the Christ child, I don't know that they connected all the dots. I don't know that they understood the significance but they'd never seen an angel, and they certainly never heard an angel chorus. And their lives were changed. I, I would have liked to have followed them over the next several weeks after this to see if some of the shine wore off. I think that happens to us sometimes. When we have a mountaintop experience, we feel really close to God, and then life happens. We kind of get back in the routine. I used to be... Um, um, a minister of youth many, many years ago, last century. Um, and we take a big old group of kids off to summer camp, right, toward the end of the summer, just before school. And those were always highlights of our year. And our kids would be so pumped, they'd be so excited, they'd feel so close to God, so close to each other. It was a wonderful time. And they went back home, went to school. And some of that closeness, some of that sense of awe that they'd experienced, the, their awareness that God had a plan for their lives, got lost in grades and ball and club and other things. I don't know what it is, why it is that it's hard for us to maintain that sense of excitement about God's activity in our lives. You would think that after what those shepherds had experienced, they had been changed forever. Obviously, they got a, a, an immediate affirmation. The angel told them what was going to happen, told them where they could go and see for themselves, told them all of this stuff about what this might mean, not only in their lives, but in the lives of every person in the world. What did they do with the news? Well, understandably, they wanted to go see for themselves. And they did. They found Joseph, they found Mary, they found the baby. And then what ended their evening was a call to action. Now, what are we going to do with what we've just experienced? You and I know the truth. We know that God sent his son. We know why God sent his son. We know why it is important for us to not only believe the story, but to believe the person the story's about. The shepherds went away from the stable that night and they told everybody they saw. Now, I mentioned to you a week or so ago that shepherds didn't have the most sterling reputation. I told you that they, don't, they weren't allowed to give testimony in court because their word couldn't be trusted. Now, why would God give a bunch of shepherds the first revelation of the birth of his son? Why would God choose somebody like them? Or why would God choose somebody like me or you? Do you know who were the first witnesses to the resurrection of Christ? The women. The women who had come to 
do honor to the body of their slain master. The same thing was true about women. You just, you know, women are so emotional. You just couldn't trust, trust them. Why would, why would God entrust a message like that to a bunch of women? Well, thank goodness he did. Because the women were faithful in telling the story. Even when the disciples, you know, the men, thought that it was all nonsense. Now, this is after Jesus had publicly, at least three times, announced what was going to happen. That he was going to the cross, but he's also going to the tomb, but he's going to leave the tomb. He was going to be raised from the dead. So it wasn't really news to them, yet they thought it was nonsense. God has an amazing way of choosing people that we might not ever expect. God chose you and me. I love the fact that the shepherds started glorifying God, praising him. You know, there's a natural response when you really sense God's presence and his blessing and his direction and sometimes his discipline that God would care so much about you. I don't know about you, when I was growing up, um, being disciplined was not a lot of fun. It usually happened to my brothers, but I had to realize later on in life when I became a dad that discipline is not a dirty word. The discipline is a way of making sure you know where the lines are. Discipline is a way of channeling your strength and your ability in productive ways. God blesses the natural response, we're told, is to glorify him and enjoy him forever. When's the last time you thought about enjoying God? When you begin to understand, I think it's so hard for us to do this, but when we begin to understand that God loves us no matter what, we, we can't do a thing that's going to make him love us more or love us less. And when God commits himself to us, he does so fully, without condition. When you understand how God feels about you, it ought to affect the way you feel about him. Angels couldn't help it. They had to sing the song. They had to burst out with the joy of heaven. And the shepherds heard it, and then they experienced it. I don't know if they sang as well as the angels, but they at least made a joyful noise. But they're not the only ones. You know, in most nativity scenes, there are three guys always included. You see these guys over here? Who are they? Who are they? Did they show up Bethlehem that night? We like it because it fits so well in a Christmas card or in a crash. You know, it just seems right to have all the group together for a picture. But they weren't there then. Oh, they come. They travel a lot further than the shepherds did. They're mysterious characters. We've even given them names. We don't know a lot about them, but we know this, that they knew something was happening that was going to impact a whole cosmos, not just the planet, the cosmos. And they wanted to be a part of it. And they did their research. And these, these magi were considered to be royalty. Whenever they traveled, they were treated as if they were honored guests. Matthew 2 we're told of their coming into what was called Palestine in Roman terms. And they ended up in the most likely place. They went to the capital. They went to Jerusalem. And they asked for an audience with the king. Now, because of who they were, they were granted an audience with the king. And they were treated in a way that you would treat visiting royalty. 
You remember how that went, King Herod, if you know much about King Herod, um, the Roman emperor at that time, Augustus, used to make a play on words that it was safer to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. The reason for that is that Herod was so paranoid that out of his family, most of them were killed because he perceived them to be threats. He was so paranoid that he ordered a list of the leading citizens around Jerusalem and beyond that upon the day of his death, they would all be executed because he wanted there to be grief in the land. This brutal, nasty tyrant, when he heard word from these visitors that there was a new king in town, a new king being born, his immediate thought was another threat to be exterminated. <laughs> so he called all of his advisors, you know. He said, find out, where, where, is this, where is this new king supposed to be born? Do you know how far Bethlehem is from uh, Jerusalem? Four or five miles? They come back to Herod and they say, we found it. It's in the, in the Old, well, they call it the Old Testament, in the Scripture. And they said, just in Bethlehem, the child is to be born there. Now, you would think that Herod, Herod might say, oh, that is great news. Let's all go. Now, he had a different plan. He couldn't wait for the wise men to get out of the way so that he could order a, a massacre. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. The wise men did leave Jerusalem. They did go down the road to Bethlehem. They did find Mary and Joseph and the child, probably in a house by now. At least that's what Matthew tells us. Listen to what happened. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. How many of you saw the Bethlehem star this week? It's kind of cool. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opened their treasure, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we could get into what all those gifts might mean, but the truth of the matter is that these highly esteemed Royal visitors acknowledge the fact that there was someone mightier than themselves, mightier than Herod, mightier than Augustus, mightier than any other. And they poured out their worship. So it was a little bit different than what the shepherds did. But the truth of the matter is the, the understandable response to what God has done in Christ is to worship. It's to express thanks. Because Christmas is a gift intended for each of us who would receive that gift. My mother was a, um, the kind of person who would go into a grocery store and by the time she was finished, she would know everybody in there. We used to go, there's three of us, the boys, we'd go with her sometimes. And she would leave us in the car. You can't do that these days, but back then, <clears throat> you know. So we'd have to stay in the, in the car, and she'd leave, and she said, do not kill anybody in this car. <laughs> uh, and then she'd go into the grocery store, and then we, it would take forever. She, this kind of character that she had, though, was so people-centered. She was really wonderful about finding people who, who needed encouragement, who needed a friend, and up in the mountains of uh, North Carolina, where they had a little place, um, she got to know a, a couple. The man was uh, a retired army vet. Um, he was very handy, um, did a lot of work around the mountains, uh, could do just about anything. He had married a young German woman, brought her back from her country to live in the United States. And... <laughs> Talk about culture shock from Germany to the hills of North Carolina. She was a very private person. She didn't speak English very well, but my mother found her and befriended her. And one day, this quiet young woman 
said to my mom, would you come upstairs? I want to show you something. And they went upstairs and she got down on her hands and knees and pulled boxes out, of, um, out from under her bed. And she says to my mother, I want to show you my pretties. Inside those boxes were some of those beautiful German um, crafted china you've ever seen. It had to be very, very valuable. And my mom thought about how sad, how sad that she cannot enjoy such a marvelous gift. She keeps it in boxes under her bed. And you know what? I think sometimes that's what we do with Christmas. We leave it in a place where we can pull it out from time to say, time and, and say, I do know what this is all about. These two very different audiences that witnessed the Christ child, the shepherds who we know were regarded with suspicion and distaste, treated as petty thieves and liars. <laughs> And then you go to the other end of the spectrum and here are the magi regarded with admiration and awe. Does that mean that there's a place for anybody and everybody at the foot of our Savior? I think it does. The differences and similarities between these two very different audiences, two very distinct social strata, the timing of their visits were a little different. Shepherds almost anonymous, magi welcomed in palaces all over. But their responses are so much alike. How were they connected? Well, in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 18, there is the story of the magi, their encounter with Herod. And we find out a couple of truths. There is no love without pain. There is no birth without tears. There is no joy without suffering. Someone once mentioned that they wondered whether or not one of those babies, those two and under male children in Bethlehem that Herod had slaughtered, were one of those kids the child of one of those shepherds? Just when we think things might be moving in a positive direction, something happens. An illness, a loss of a job, a severed relationship, a pandemic. Things happen to us that can knock us, that can crush us, can shatter us, unless we know what it means to See the Christ child for who he is. Herod really wanted to eliminate the threat of the new king of the Jews. And you may know the story of how Joseph and Mary left Bethlehem and traveled down to Egypt and stayed there for a while. And see how God provides while they were in Bethlehem, I'm sure Joseph found a way to do some carpentry so they'd have food to eat. But after the Magi came, they had those gifts that could be used to see to it that Joseph could take care of his family while they were a long way from home. What difference does the nativity make? We get so caught up in Christmas, we get so caught up in the rush, and even in this strange year of ours, there were times when you didn't go to Target or Walmart or somewhere else because you just didn't want to put up with that mess. There was, there was a woman um, who was very, very busy. She ran her own company. The holidays were getting closer. She realized the one thing she hadn't done, she wasn't going to buy gifts this year. She just, just didn't have time to fool with that. But Christmas was coming. So she tells her assistant, now, just go to the store and buy Christmas cards. I'm going to send them out to 50 people. That's all I'm going to do. So the assistant goes and buys the cards and brings them back. She signs them very quickly, gets them in the mail. 
And then one of the cards came back. The address was wrong. And for the first time, she opened the card to see what was written on the inside. It's always a good idea to read what's on the inside. This is what it said on the inside. This Christmas card is just to say, a little gift is on the way. (laughs) She had outsmarted herself. What difference does the nativity make? Another author that I have enjoyed through the years is Robert Fulgham. Maybe you read his book, All I Wanted to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. It's worth a read if you haven't read it. He says he makes lots of lists. Do you know anybody who makes lots of lists? One of the lists that he normally would make, and particularly around Christmas because there was so much to do, would be a things-to-do list. Then one Christmas he decided instead of a things-to-do list, he was going to make a things-to-be list. And maybe what can happen to us in this afterglow is to realize that we have much to do that has nothing to do with buying gifts or attending parties or any of the other things that are normally associated with the celebration of Christmas. Maybe what we have to do is what we have to be. That the joy that we sing about at Christmas is a part of our everyday that no matter what we face, there is this abiding joy. You know the difference between happiness and joy? Happiness depends on the circumstance. I can be happy that my team won a game. I can be happy that my child got good grades. I can be happy that I haven't made my wife angry yet. But joy isn't dependent on circumstance. Joy, joy is that which undergirds everything I do, everything I am, because my hope is not in my performance. I'll mess it up, and so will you. My hope is in Jesus Christ, who came into this world as a tiny, vulnerable, fragile little child as if God was saying now here I want to give you something more precious to me than anything else that he would entrust his own son to us I know how we treated him you know what Jesus said he said you know how the world treated me the world's going to treat you the same way why because the world can't stand the light. In the Gospel of John, when he has these, this glorious prologue that tells us about the Word becoming flesh, he says that the people would rather live in the dark. The light will frighten them. It's almost like turning on the light in, in a room and there the bugs are scram, scrambling around trying to find safety. God wanted to bring light into your life and mine, but he wanted that light to be shared. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth. Now, I can't produce light. I'm kind of like the moon. I can only reflect light. The sun is the one, the S-O-N is the one, the one source of light, but I can reflect his light. And his light in me and through me and in you and through you can make a difference in everyday life. What does the nativity, what difference does it make for you? Well, we're about to find out, aren't we? Because now we know the truth. And you know what? Once you know the truth, you are responsible for the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus said that. I think he meant it. So if he is the way, the truth, and the life, and I know that to be true, 
What have I done to let light shine in the dark places of my life, in my community, in my home, in my school, in my store, wherever I am? How does the light find darkness and drive it away? It is said that on, the only thing you have to do to drive away the dark is to light a match. You might not think your flame matters very much. You might even feel like one of these candles here that doesn't have long to live. But the truth of the matter is that your light makes a whole lot of difference. It's an old story, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Old story about a, a man who's walking along the beach. And he looks over and he sees somebody right at the edge of the water and he's bending down and he's picking up something and throwing it out in the ocean. And he gets closer and he realizes that there are thousands of starfish that, have, that are there on the sand. And they're going to die because they can't get back into the water. And the man is laughing at this fella. He says, what do you think you're doing? You're going to pick up all of these, all of these starfish and throw them in the ocean? What difference are you going to make? And he looks at the starfish in his hands and he said, it'll make a difference to this one. You and I have a chance to make this world a better place. Now that we know the truth and we know that the truth will set us free, don't you know some people who are in bondage? who are fearful, anxious, depressed, discouraged, defeated. You don't have to have all the answers. You only have to have the answer. Would you share Christ this week? Would you do it not only by word, but by deed? Would you let people see the light that God has allowed you to reflect? Would you let somebody this week know that you know the truth? Let's pray together. Father, we bow in stunning admiration that at just the right time, Christ came to this world. That you gave this indescribable gift and it was meant for everybody. And that same little child would grow to be the man who became sin for each of us, who took our penalty, our punishment. This same Jesus who is the same today yesterday and forever. The same Jesus is the light of the world. And he shares his light with us and through us. And because of that, we can point people to our source of joy. It was never meant for us to hoard. It was meant for us to share. So take us just as we are. We're not perfect, far from it. We don't have all the reasons and explanations and answers to all the problems that we might confront. But we can count on this. The, le the same love that sent your son to be our savior, that same love will see us through, will make a way. Help us to trust that to believe it with all our hearts and help us to reflect, reflect the light of joy. Help us to do that this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.